welcome everyone uh, to the EEX Colloquium today. Uh, we're very lucky to have with us Kwok Lee from Google. Um, Kwok and I actually overlapped uh, for one year at Stanford. When I was about to graduate, Kwok uh, joined Stanford as a PhD student, so he's quite a bit younger than me. Um, so he was also in Andering's lab there. And I think he was the first student in Andrew's lab that was pretty much um, all deep learning. Um, and from there, he went to Google. And it's been a lot of deep learning since. And Quark's record is just absolutely phenomenal. So I have to have him here just to give you a sampling of some of the things he's worked on that you might not even remember anymore that people did this because it's such a kind of common thing in today's toolbox. But Quark um, uh, was one of the authors on the sequence to sequence learning paper that kind of showed neural networks can really be used for machine translation and other sequence to sequence problems. He was on the um, word embeddings, distributed representation of sentences and documents uh, paper. He um, was um, on the neural architecture search paper with RL. Um, he did efficient net. Um, he did one of the earliest uh, neural nets that use attention, the li listen, attend, and spell paper. Um, he um, actually did some automatic augmentations, learning automatic augmentations has been very uh, impactful. And the list goes on and on. Quark actually has um, 19 papers that are cited more than a thousand times, including uh, some of them cited, uh, sequence disease learning cited almost 15,000 times, which is just amazing Quark. Um, really nice work, very excited to have you. We're very curious what you've been up to recently. And with this, I'll, I'll give it to you. Uh, thank you, Peter, and uh, it's an honor for me to be here. Uh, honor to have uh, the introduction by Peter. He's, I always, uh, you know, I overlap with Andrew, and I always say, ask Andrew, uh, I, I overlap with Peter, and our co-advisor is Andrew, and I ask Andrew, you know, like Andrew sometimes comes to me and uh, complain about my performance, and I say, well, how could I improve? He said, he say, you know, try to be like Peter. So, so. Um, you know, I've been I've been trying to catch up with Peter. That's one. Uh, the second thing is an honor to be here at Berkeley, uh, because uh, Berkeley has a, a lot of my of my academic heroes. You know, I've done a lot of work over the years. So uh, some of the things that I'm excited in the past few years are uh, neural architecture search and uh, meta pseudo labels. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna present some of the work uh, in this area today. Um, but my broad interests are going to be, uh, you know, even in uh, 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 large language models and other things. But the focus of today is this topic. Uh, this is also the work, uh, John work by many people uh, at Google. So um, uh, just to step back a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, why I'm, I'm getting into this area. So. Uh, so I started at Google as an intern uh, around 2011, um, and then the free food at Google makes it really hard for me to leave. Uh, so uh, anyway, I started working on uh, computer vision, uh, and one of the work that I did there was uh, the idea of using unsupervised learning, uh, using uh, uh, images uh, from YouTube to learn uh, unsupervised learning to get uh, like to, uh, like a neuron that can be very sensitive sensitive to certain uh, um, uh, images. For example, we discover like a cat neuron uh, that actually is very sensitive uh, sensitive to image of cats. And then after that, I uh, as uh, introduced by Peter, I work on a lot of text uh, related projects like paragraph vectors, uh, sequence to sequence, and then. Uh, uh, I also work on pre-trained language models. So today, a lot of people know about BERT and ELMO and GPT. Uh, so back, you know, in around 2015, we also worked on, uh, you know, the, some of the first versions of doing using pre-trained language models to improve downstream applications. Uh, so the, some of the pinnacle uh, of all a lot of my projects in NLP uh, um, came in this project called GNMT where we basically train uh, neural machine translation, sig to sig models uh, to do translation end-to-end. Uh, -end. So this is uh, one of the first uh, system to do end-to-end -end machine translation in the world. Uh, and right now it basically, uh, it basically replaced uh, 
uh, phrase-based translation systems. Uh, so if you use Google Translate, you already inter and interact with this. Uh, so after that, around 2017, um, at the end of 2017, I started working on uh, architecture search and semi-supervised learning, which are some of the topics that I'm talking uh, today. So, so why I why did I end up working on architecture search? Okay, so uh, so the story like this. So um, uh, you know, around uh, a number of years ago, uh, we uh, we plot the accuracy versus number of parameter for um, neural networks uh, in the ImageNet dataset. Um, so this is top one accuracy on uh, you know the validation set of ImageNet. And you see a strong correlation between the model size and top one accuracy. So, uh, um, that, so, so this is quite predictable. So what's gonna happen here is bigger models are gonna be better model. So that's nice. So that's the blessing. Now the curse is that the axis, the, 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 uh, the X axis is in log. So what that means is that by making blowing up this model a hundred times bigger, you can just get a little bit of improvement in accuracy. So that's both that's the curse of this scaling law. Uh, so how do we bend this curve? So that's what what that's the question that I has bothered me uh, for a long time. How do we instead of like going like that? Can we bend it? to go more like upwards like that. Even if it's a straight line, can we bend it upward like that? And of course, Moore's law is gonna kick in uh, to improve this, this, this curve, right, this line. But you know, Moore's law is gonna slow down and that's gonna be uh, harder to make progress. Um, and, uh, and in the broader picture, uh, not just about uh, ImageNet, if you look at compute demand, or uh, this is a blog post by OpenAI, and uh, they plot the com compute demand of deep learning. And if you look into the, uh, going from AlexNet to AlphaGo Euro, uh, and if you plot all again, uh, you know, you will see like a, a huge de increase in demand. And again, the, uh, the y-axis here is in log, right? So, uh, sorry, in exponential, right? So you, you see that it's actually going rapidly, uh, 300,000 times. Um, so how do we bend this, this curve, uh, this line, basically? And um, so we've been thinking about, is there any way to automatic, to automate the, end, the, the design of these models uh, in such a way that they are uh, faster and more um, uh, uh, faster uh, for at least for inference. So inference is a big deal. So if you look at into inference at Google, most of the compute at Google is actually on the inference, not just training. But ideally, training too. Can we actually both improve training and inference speed of these models? Uh, so uh, one idea here we develop is using uh, reinforcement learning or evolution to basically sample models like candidate models and train on a proxy, small proxy tasks, and then get the accuracy, some form of free world, and then feed it back into the controller and run this, you know, maybe 10,000 times. And the, the, the catch here is that because we train it on a small proxy task, the training doesn't blow up. Uh, um, as much. And once you finish uh, on the proxy task, we take the, you know, maybe the top 10 candidates or something like that, and then train it on the final task, right? And uh, uh, although we started with, with just simple, uh, uh, simple that, like that, we recently what we do is efficiency aware architecture search, where not only accuracy is a signal, but we also incorporate latency of flops into like a multi-objective reward where we take accuracy and divide it by latency and then you, you know feed it into the controller so that it learns over time to sample better and better uh, uh, decisions and uh, 
Now, the, well, one thing that I will give as a caveat is that although um, a lot of the process in neural architecture search is automated, one thing that is not automated is uh, creating the search space. So this is an area that we're still working on is trying to overcome the uh, manual process of designing the search space. But at the moment, what we're doing is for, let's suppose that we want to create a new model to replace, say, transformer. Then we basically start with a uh, the human design models and create a search space around it. Or if we want to replace a human design model in computer vision, we would look at the state of the art model in computer vision, and then we'd create a search space around it. And then, you know, we search in that space, search space to find the better model. Now, for that reason, it will never discover a more, an outrageous model that is very different uh, from the initial model. However, it will, like, it will optimize in such a way that sometimes you can get even 10x improvement. Uh, so, for example, um, some of the decision that the IL controller need to make is, uh, for example, like, you know, let's let's pick. This is like a neural net that does uh, that goes uh, into your phone to do, uh, you know, image recognition. Uh, it's called MobileNet V3. Uh, and basically, some of the decisions that we have to choose are basically things like how, you know, um, each of this layer. What is the kernel size that go into each of this block? Is it five by five kernel? Is it one by one kernel? Or seven by seven or three by three? Uh, and then, you know, number of filters that go into um, this, this, this block. Is it six filters or is it uh, eight filter or is it three filters, right? Uh, do we need the skip connection here? So sometimes you don't, right? Uh, so do we need the skip connection? Uh, so, and how, how many times we take this block and repeat it, um, right? So some of the fairly basic decisions like that. Um, and then uh, uh, we search for a model. So here in this figure, I'm showing you uh, ImageNet top one accuracy, um, uh, ImageNet top one accuracy, and then uh, number of parameters. Uh, on the x-axis. Now, what we saw was that uh, we can find a model called efficient net V0 that is extremely efficient um, on the small scale compared to human design. So for example, here, here are the state of the art. This is the human design frontier. This is like, uh, you know, Kaiming He and all the, you know, smart computer scientists. Uh, working to design this model, and they're very good. But what we found was that we found an efficient at B0 that is 9x, searching from a very similar search space like DenseNet, that is 9x better than DenseNet. So what's surprising is that the amount of gain that you can get from this, really, by just using the search space that built on top of the models that people already designed. Right, so you just vary the the like people when people design this model, they would say, oh, let's use three by three convolution throughout the network. But we say, oh, how about just use five, somewhere you use five by five, and somewhere you use um, you know seven by seven, but uh, at the uh, and then you use less of layers, for example, right? We don't repeat as many layers, for example. Or sometimes you don't use skip connection so that you avoid further com uh, computation. And for and such decision will lead you to efficient at B0 um, on like a very small uh, number of parameters and much better than like the state of the app back there. Now, the problem is that we've, after we find uh, this efficient at B0, the next question is how it is only one model. Can we do better? Can we develop like an envelope the better than human designs. Can you, for example, can you divide, can we search for a model that better directly, you know, using the same number, uh, uh, maybe using the same number of parameters like SE net, but better, or get a better accuracy, uh, I get the same level of accuracy like SE net, but much better in number of parameters. Now, uh, 
we found that you know searching directly on big model size is very expensive, right? Uh, as I told you before, that we tend to focus on small tasks and uh, proxy proxy tasks. And here we deliberately search the, uh, on the proxy task of small models, right? So for that we get the gain. But searching for the big task, which is in the same amount of um, uh, model size with SENet would be would be very expensive. So the thought process then is that can you can we figure out a way to scale up these models, right? Uh, so scaling is another question that we're actually trying to answer in our research. It turns out that the previous research would do something like this. They they will basically either they take a neural network and then they make the number of channels uh, uh, bigger. So for example, let's suppose that you are uh, at layer, uh, at every layer, you will just make the number of layers twice as big. So if, in order to get a bigger, twice as big model, you go at every layer and you say, uh, this layer one, if it's 16 uh, filters, you blow it up into 32. And layer two, if it's uh, 32 filters, you blow it in, into 64. So that's where you can get a twice as big of as a model. So that's one strategy that people do. The second strategy that people do is making the um, uh, making the uh, the the uh, um, uh, the 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 network deeper. For example, another strategy that people do is making the network deeper. So uh, so they take one layer and then blow it up. In they they duplicate it into two layers, right? So that's another strategy. Um, uh, and then other strategy like making the uh, the resolution uh, higher. So you take the image and then you blow the image bigger. Instead of like um, just keep all the layers the same, but make the image twice as big. So that's already already a, another strategy to make, to spend more uh, compute to get better accuracy. So we look into a lot of these strategies and we found that oh maybe. Maybe one doing one strategy at a time is not good. Maybe we should figure out a, a good scaling law for all of these strategies. So how to combine these strategies together? So we developed something called compound scaling, which basically combine all the scaling. So basically, we try to figure out, let's suppose that we are trying to scale the network twice as big then we basically split that twice as big into some investment in making the network wider, uh, some investment in making the network deeper, and some investment in making the network high resolution. But the question is, how much we should we balance these, these factors? Um, so we developed like a theoretical um, uh, uh, model for this. So basically, uh, you know, depth would be some alpha, you know, scaled up sometimes with some beta scaled up sometimes and gamma scaled up sometimes. And then basically, you know, some, some kind of mathematical analysis of uh, how we should scale up these models. Uh, so, and then some of these alpha, beta and gamma, we kind of search locally to find the right combination. Um, so basically the, in, you know, you can go, you can go into the paper. This is, this is the paper that, uh, describe this method, but basically the the intuition is that we want to give equal power to depth width and set resolution. Uh, if we if we don't give uh, uh, if we give too much in depth, then the network will become so deep that you really need more resolution to counter it. Right. So we want some balance here. So we did that. So we take B0 and then we figure out these uh, scaling factors and we develop a family called efficient net that basically uh, get very good balance uh, between uh, number of parameters and image net top one accuracy. And for example, one model called B4 that is actually 10x better in, uh, in um, number of parameters compared to the state of the art. Like this is the best human designed. And uh, um, you know, the work was published in 2019. Um, so 
anyway, so this is pretty complicated. So maybe I can pause there a little bit and what, uh, uh, welcome some question. Well, I'm actually pretty curious, Quark, um, how you came up with um, that equation, what the intuition is behind it, that that's the right way to scale. Alpha times beta squared, I think times gamma squared equals two. Okay, okay. And if there's something okay. more general that we might, you know, use in other places. And I see another question in chat. Oh, okay, so basically the idea is this, right? So let's suppose that you blow up the image bigger, then you might want to also increase the depth of the network a little bit deeper so that you end up with a neuron in the network that see a, as big as a receptive field like before. Does it make some sense here? So right. if you blow up the image, then the, at the top of the network, you have one neuron, let's suppose that the entire network is all three by three convolution. So at the top of the network, there's a neuron that actually suddenly see smaller part of the image compared to before. So we want to blow up the depth of the network to counter it a little bit. And this equation that going in, in this equation is basically trying to do something like that. Um, hard, you know, it's hard to explain in the equation, but you know, because if you see beta square, gamma square, has something to do with the image being two dimensional. Okay. So you had, uh, you had another question actually in in the in the chat. It's a uh, Jai Hao. You can ask your question now. No, go ahead. Please. Okay. Can I ask a question? Oh uh, yeah. So for the for the neural architecture search, I think you do you always choose the maximal according to your like a test. So can I understand in the reinforcement learning there is just guide you away in the search space? Yeah. So, okay. So not basically this is technical details, but I can go in. For example, to find this B0, to find this B0, the process is the following. You create a search space that which basically mimicking, you know, like some dense net, some combination between exception dense net and rest net or something like that, some combination of this. You know, make sure that the model is basically it, one candidate in the search space would be this model, one candidate would be this model, one candidate would be this model, and the other candidate would be, you know, like a mobile net or something like that, right? So we pick some of the top models in the field in this area, and then we say, okay, create a search space for that. So that's the first step. Second step is we create a proxy task. Basically, ImageNet a model training usually take maybe like uh, a few days of training. That would be too expensive. So we say, okay. Let's train it on, you know, a few epochs only. So that would reduce you to like maybe a few hours. Okay, so that's the first thing. And then we train on, the, uh, we use a neural architecture search with the IAL to search for the best models in that proxy task. Uh, and then we find, you know, the, the top maybe 10 models. And then we take the top 10 models and we train them as if they were real. And then we pick the best model uh, from the long training. Did I answer your question? Yes. So, yeah. So, a uh, uh, quick follow up questions. So, since you design a reinforced learning policy, how do you uh, want that policy near the like uh, the human design architecture? Is that so oh, we we, no, we don't have any intention to get uh, to um, to recover any design uh, the human design architecture. In in fact, we want the opposite. We want it, the controller to find uh, you know very different models and better accuracy. But um, we want the search space to cover to one point in the search space would be ResNet, let's say, and then one point in the search space would be more on uh, MobileNet V three, something like that. Thanks so much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you had another question in the Q&A from Arvind. Did you want to ask your question? Yeah. Uh, hey, Kwok, for uh, Arvind. Hey, Arvind. So yeah. the, the alpha, beta square, gamma square that Peter was asking about, uh, I believe that like it comes because of the flops, right? Like depth is linear uh, in flops yeah. for the model, but where the resolution and channels are like quadratic. And, and that's why you had the beta square and gamma square. But, but when you have alpha, it's just like, like yeah. power to power one. Is it, is it, would that be the right argument for, for yeah, using yeah, that okay. sort of term? Yes, yes, that's correct. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just want to no, I, Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, lots of engineering stuff, really. Uh, but uh, since we published uh, the, uh, Efficient Net um, uh, in 2019, we got a lot of criticism. And one of the biggest criticism is we optimizing for number of parameters and number of flops. And but we don't factor into latency, right? So. Uh, what we try to uh, we try to do back then was basically we want somewhat like platform independent. We don't want a search model for to work really well on TPU but doesn't work on GPU, let's say, right? Uh, and or uh, we don't want to search for a model that work well on CPU but doesn't work well on uh, um, GPU. So we we want to be platform independent. But the platform the, the the problem with platform independent is that like even if it's better in parameters and flops, if you run it on TPU, sometimes it's actually slower in some of these models uh, than some of these models. Um, and uh, the problem is that the software stack sometimes have problems. For example, uh, in the search space, we have this depth-wise convolution layer. This is actually quite slow and it's hard to implement it fast um, in TPU, let's say. So, so some of these small problems. So. Uh, since then, we learned some of these lessons and then we said, okay, how about this? How about we search, but we factor into latency as well, okay? So we search um, for parameter flops and latency. And these are the three parameters in the, uh, in the uh, uh, objective function together with accuracy. So it will be accuracy, parameters, flops, and GPU latency. And we use that as the objective. And then we search. And uh, in, uh, recently, maybe like uh, a couple of weeks ago, we released this uh, efficient at V2, where uh, we develop models that actually the envelope. So um, uh, we, we don't use more models anymore. We only uh, focus on like three model size, model one, two, and three, a model one, two, and three. And, uh, Basically, uh, compared to before, we also developed better models. Um, uh, so efficient net, the original efficient net would be like that. And uh, efficient net would be better in both three areas. And then it's also um, uh, better in, uh, uh, you know, flops and latency and better than, you know, rest net, better than VIT, you know, some of the recent vision transformer rest net, uh, you know, basically stay of the art in uh, accuracy and latency uh, everywhere. And uh, one thing that we also did was we dropped, an, uh, during the, um, the development of this um, efficient net V1, we learned that net wise convolution was slow. So we did some trick to replace one of the operation in the space. Um, and it turns out that that's also help in terms of number of parameters and number of flops improvement as well. So some change in the search space and then some change in the objective function, how we search that led us to efficient net V2. Um, and uh, some of the literature in this space, you know, like uh, original paper, uh, the NAS with IL paper, uh, and what we published in 2016. And then uh, our breakthrough uh, was in 2019, where we used NAS for mobile vision. So uh, MobileNet V3 right now is using NAS to find the model architecture. And then the, the next breakthrough that we had was efficient net was basically took, taking some of the ideas in you know, MobileNet V3 and scaling to get you know, the model architecture that I told you earlier and then efficient at V2, which is the latest generation of these models. And uh, efficient net and efficient at V2s are, are, are pretty uh, useful. A lot of um, you know, teams at Google and uh, a lot of industry labs, they actually use it in production as backbone for segmentation and detection and so on. Uh, so, but broadly speaking, right? Today talk, I've, I've been talking about just uh, just uh, talking about um, uh, you know neural architecture search as a focus, but one uh, one of the broader interests of mine was uh, you know uh, how to do better AI, and uh, so I have this slide that I uh, tell some of my friends is this right. So if you look back in the history 
of AI, you see actually um, three generations of uh, machine learning, uh, you know, three generation of AI really. The first AI is, I would call, you know, more like good old fashioned AI, um, where you basically learn nothing, but you mostly handcraft the predictions. And then the second generation, I would say mostly shallow learning where you handcraft the features like SIFT and Hawks and so on. And uh, we basically learn the predictions. Now, what deep learning did was that it, it revolutionized uh, some of these areas by uh, you, we only handcraft the algorithm. So architectures and data processing, but we learn features uh, and prediction end to end. So what deep learning really uh, save us is basically instead of handcrafting the features, we learn the features and prediction end to end, thanks to uh, back propagation. I predict though, the next generation of AI will need some form of uh, um, learning also the algorithm as well, end to end. So in the future, what really a, a design feature of AI method would be we handcraft nothing, but we also then, but, but we use data and compute to learn the algorithm, the features and predictions end to end. That's what I, you know, broadly, and neural architecture search kind of fit into this because we kind of learn the architecture, right? Uh, but I think, you know, we can generalize neural architecture search more than that, basically trying to also learn, say, the backdrop equation or learn, you know, uh, the learning rate schedule or the data processing uh, pipeline, right? All kind of thing, or even the activation function of the network, or maybe developing something even more fundamental, right? People develop like the self attention layer or the convolution la layers that are actually kind of revolutionize uh, deep learning. So uh, same question, can you use automation to actually develop some of these layers from scratch? Uh, so because of that, I, I became interested in this project called AutoML Zero, where the, the goal was to actually evolve machine learning from scratch. So here we have like a you know, like small MNIST binary classification task. And then we have a, a, um, a template, which is basically a, uh, that has three functions, setup, prediction, and uh, learn. So set, setup is like uh, initialization. Predict would be something like uh, the test function in your program or validation function in your program, machine learning program. And learn would be the grading, the grading descent function in your, uh, you know, deep learning program. And then we and then we give AutoML zero access to like a NumPy library, right? A NumPy would be matrix multi multiplication, uh, um, so, uh, uh, matrix vector uh, dot product, and things like that, right? Like basic linear algebra uh, operations. And then we ask evolution to actually fill in the template of these functions, you know. Give, like write down the, the 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 equation or the update or whatever it wants though, so that there we improve in this small tiny in amnist classification task, and something really happened. So what happened uh, uh, here is that it's uh, so the the x axis is actually in log. So this is ten to the twelve generation. So this is a lot of programs, right? But uh, it took us about two weeks, two weeks, about 10,000 CPUs, two weeks. And it went, went from generating like first a linear model, like um, it started by like an empty algorithm, of course, with the template. And slowly, you know, after almost 10 to the 10 generation of nothing, it actually started showing, getting linear model without any SGD. So it handcraft a linear model first. And then it started figuring out that learning is a good concept. So it developed linear model with SGD. And then moving on, it started learning the idea of deep networks and it uh, showing ReLU activation function. And then slowly into, you know, closer to the 10 to the 12 generation, it started showing um, uh, multi-captive uh, interactions, 
Um, so funnily enough, when we when we got this network, it's actually is not very typical. So we said, oh, we got a home run here, because most machine learning researchers never heard of this thing called multiplicative interaction. So if you basically you take two layer and then you do um, element wise dot product something like that, which is a, not very typical. Uh, it's basically more like cell attention layer, but it's different, it's slightly different. So we thought that oh, this is like a, this is like a some we hit a home run because we developed something new. Uh, interestingly, uh, um, there's a research paper on this topic quite recently. So you know the machine learning uh, the, the the search method we uh, uh, discover something that people already found. Uh, and in addition, and in addition to that, you know a lot of some product teams at Google, uh, you know, also explore this idea with some success as well. So we actually had a couple of questions already. If you wanted to take a couple in line, or if you want to, sure, go ahead. There was a question, uh, Jack uh, Newsom. Do you want to ask your question directly to Paul? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Okay, please. Yeah. Okay. So my question was, um, I guess, sort of about. Uh, this auto ML stuff as a whole, but um, uh, last semester I, I took a reinforcement learning class and for my term project, I actually implemented <clears throat> AutoHouse in, in PyTorch. And mm -hmm. just doing experiments, I, I noticed that I could greatly improve the convergence time of my controllers. If I mm -hmm. sampled um, multiple uh, child models per, per reinforcement uh, step. So I wondered mm -hmm. if you had an opinion on this in, in general as like a theoretical idea. Oh, so oh, you mean how to improve the conversions of the controller? Uh, yeah, basically. I just, I, I, um, in, okay. I believe in the original statement of the algorithm, the, the idea is to sample only one, one model per reinforcement step. Yeah. But I, oh, I yeah, yeah. So, okay. So, uh, okay. Going back to that, uh, slide over here. Okay. So, uh, you mean this, uh, this, this slide, right? Uh, more like this slide. Um, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, so the controller that we use is more like, uh, yeah, the controller that we usually use is, oh, giving some credit to uh, Peter and uh, Berkeley. We use PPO, which is basically based on TRPO. Um, and that's our favorite algorithm right now. And uh, the controller is like, a, is like, a, a, like an LSTM that generate one decision at a time and trained by PPO. The other thing that we also do is uh, we, uh, instead of training just one model, we train maybe like 10 models or something, like about the size of 10. And each model would be trained uh, concurrently. Uh, 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 each model would be trained uh, on a separate computer. So that's that's one thing. Now, another thing that I haven't talked to you about is the idea of called efficient neural architecture search. So this is something that I kind of gloss over a little bit. but. Um, since we did the work on architecture search, a lot of people developed something called efficient uh, neural architecture search, and the idea is as follows. So instead, of, so a lot of neural architecture search is you can think of it as like multi-trial search, where one model is generated at a, uh, at a time and tried, and then feedback to the controller, right? And if you start a new model, you don't inherit any knowledge from the past, right? Even though the you know in the past you only trained one model, so people, realizing that uh, that people developed this idea. Well, they said this: How about we create like a supernet? So a supernet is like a big network that has all sort of options in it. So so you start in from the input, and then you can have three by three convolution at one branch, five by five convolution convolution at one branch, and then you know seven by seven convolution at another branch. And then, so every path of the network like, is a candidate model, really. And then you, after you train, um, uh, after you train uh, the model, uh, uh, after you, you train one candidate model, maybe for like a couple of steps, that's all. You train the candidate model for a couple of steps, and the next time you sample a model, if you overlap with existing model, you use the weights from the previous model. So you have a lot of amortized from the previous model, and then you save compute about like a fraction of a hundred or a thousand times. So that's that's another thing that we try a lot at Google to speed up. Now, if you just want to focus on the multi-trial search, then I I would recommend uh, PPO 
with a an L, LSDM controller. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I I, I had played around with the the weight sharing implemented in um, efficient yeah. architecture yeah. as well. But yeah. Okay. Yeah, Thank yeah, you very yeah. much. Uh, yeah, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, um, if you uh, if you want like a, a good uh, implementation of uh, weight sharing, I recommend the paper called Tunas, T U N A S. So it's yeah. open source, and uh, we already cook up a lot of search space inside the thing. And then basically, mostly it's just back propagation to learn the architectures. Right. Yep. Yeah. And so yeah, there yeah. was also a question from uh, Grace Din. Did you want to ask your question, Grace? Sure, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. So you mentioned learn to learn and other uh, approaches towards using uh, machine learning to sort of autonomously figure out uh, the best uh, uh, neural architecture to use. Mm -hmm. And the transforms that you're using seem to, to heavily, uh, um, to, seem to possibly heavily change their performance in various, uh, various hardware, since for in instance, you're modifying the, the sizes yeah. of various pieces of data. Uh, so given like this is an, an additional large search space, um, how do you think this is going to mesh with, um, with hardware configuration? Uh, do you think that the problems that, it's, that it, it's good for are generally small enough that it'll work on like anything it produces will perform well on, on, on any given hard, uh, hardware? Do you think that it will need to, you'll need to embed hardware constraints in it? Or will, do you intend to learn large amounts of the hardware configuration on them as well. Uh, yeah. Oh, this is a really deep question. So this is an issue that we are very torn about at Google. So the first generation of efficient net, for example, was platform independent. But then when we what, what we discovered was that, you know, like the software stack was so slow. Even though we find a model that is really um, efficient in theoretical, you know, flops, when when it's implemented, it's actually slow. So we, what ended up happening is that we have to run another generation with efficient IP2. So I think in the future we really have to incorporate like signal from the the um, the the uh, the hardware itself. And the way that we do it uh, practically uh, practically at the moment is that we have like a learn a learn function. So basically, uh, if you have like a three by three convolution, five by five, and so on, we can actually predict a little bit about given this model. How, how long does it take to learn? Uh, how long does it take? So we, we learn like a, a cost function. So the cost function, we instead of like calling into the platform itself or how long it takes to train, we call in the cost function. So a cost function is like a software that mimics the behavior of the platform. So that's what we, we add uh, did, did I answer your question? Yeah, I think that makes sense. You, just, just to just make sure I understand, you're, you're basically treating performance as an additional objective in addition yeah. to accuracy yeah. or, or yeah. I have a, another question about uh, where is the uh, multi uh, multiplicative uh, multi multiplicative uh, interaction paper? I can send it maybe uh, uh, like an email, but you if you search it like multiplicative interaction, you you find it uh, online. Interaction. Yeah, yeah interaction. Yeah. Uh, so this this one here, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, there's still I'm gonna I'm gonna let it let you roll through because I know you still have some things you want to share with us. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I I have a lot of stuff. So oh, <laughs> how 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 many how much time I have left? I mean, oh my goodness, I'm slow. Uh, anyway, so I, I keep going. Okay, so here here's uh, here's another thing that we also recently uh, recently done is trying to evolve a reinforcement learning algorithm, and this is done by. A, uh, a colleague of, uh, of us, uh, Alexander Faust, and her, her intern, which is uh, JD. Uh, he's also a PhD student at uh, Berkeley. So in this project, we're basically trying to, you know, evolve an alternative uh, computer pro, uh, an update rather than DQN, for example. And it seems that he was learning. He found like a good update rule. So this paper gonna be uh, gonna appear at uh, iClear. Another thing that we learned was uh, learn, trying to find a better activation function, really, right? So one activation function that people use a lot is this uh, ReLU, right? The blue one, that's the blue. Uh, you know, it's a max of zero um, and X. Uh, but we found that we use a, also the same search method, right? And then we found that uh, 
there's a, a, a soft version of this activation function that actually quite uh, works quite well. It's called, um, it's basically works like this. It's x times sigma of x. Uh, and the shape is actually almost like ReLU, but if you train this model, it actually works better. Um, so we, we saw this and then we wrote a paper, but uh, uh, interestingly, this activation function was also discovered a little bit earlier by human experts. Um, uh, and now it's becoming really popular uh, as a replacement for, uh, uh, for ReLU. Um, many people said good things about it. And it's actually, if you want to do improve adversarial robustness, uh, then using, if you use this activation function and use it, uh, use it with uh, adversarial training, you get a lot of big boost in uh, adversarial robustness. Okay, so this, uh, okay, so th I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on to the second part of the, my talk. So that, that's first part of my talk is about using auto ML neural architecture search to find uh, you know, better models and better algorithms and better activation function. Second part of my talk, I'm going to talk about more on, uh, uh, you know, uh, pseudo labels um, and semi-supervised learning. Now, uh, before I begin, I want to just start by saying this is the trend of accuracy on ImageNet in the last uh, uh, five or six years, right? Um, so uh, on the x-axis, I would plot uh, time, and uh, on the y-axis, I would plot accuracy, and I crop it around 78%. So uh, ResNet, the most people favorite would be not in this figure, it's uh, about 76%. Now, a lot of the, the work that we've done in the past few years, including NASNet and AmigoNet and so on, have led to a, an accuracy of 90% accuracy on ImageNet, top one. And the recent two bumps in accuracy, first around uh, early 2020, and second around early 2021 was done by, uh, you know, by us. And the, I'm going to present them in this paper. So it's going from 86.4% to 88.4%, and then from uh, you know 88.6% to like 90.2%. So these 2% bumps are what happened, uh, are work done by us. And the key idea here is to basically use more unlabeled data. And um, uh, now, Using unlabeled data to improve models, people have seen it before, so that's not special. Now, what's special is actually improve the real state of the art, the, the, the really best models. That's hard. And why is it so hard? Is it because this model get access, access to already a lot of uh, labeled data. So ImageNet already have 1 million images. So most researchers, they work on you know, low data regime, like 10% or something like that. But most of those algorithms don't scale. They can't make them work for uh, for the high end, you know, like the full image net. So what you've seen here is quite special. That actually unlabeled data really does work very well for image net. Um, so so first of all, I want to talk about the intuition about this, right? Like first of all, uh, image net model uh, tend to see about 1.3 million images. But like if you do a back of envelope calcula calculation, 10 years old, um, maybe we'll see, you know, 7.5 million images or something like that. And most of them are unlabeled. So the intuition, you know, this is, this is not contrarian really. Most people in deep learning will agree with me that, you know, the next step in deep learning is to use how to use unlabeled data effectively to improve these models. Um, now it turns out that a lot of these things don't work. So I have a lot of failures, right? This is hard. Uh, like I have a lot of failures. So I, I worked for the past 10 years, I worked all sort of projects and they all failed really. Um, but we recently bumped into something that worked really well. So let, let me try to, see, to explain why previous people failed and why th this time we got the success. Okay, so what is the, what is the, what's the, um, the intuition of why people fail is the problem. So most research today, when you talk about, you know, uh, unsupervised learning or semi-supervised learning, they think about low data regime, right? So every uh, data set would have one label image, uh, uh, you know, of 10 label images or something like that, right? Uh, that's the training data set. Now, what happened is that 
you will get the semi-supervised learning or unsupervised pre-training or whatever, gonna improve the accuracy there. But something that a lot of people don't tell you is that in the industry, people are willing to collect more data. Collecting more data is a real option at Google, right? You can spend like another, you know, million dollars to get more data. And what happened is that as you collect more data, the semi-supervised learning actually not doing very well anymore. And uh, the semi-supervised learning or the pre-training doesn't work very well anymore. And su supervised learning just hammer with more data square so well. And that's a problem. That is a real problem that I was facing. So basically I got a lot of good success on the left side of the figure, but I never got, like before what I've talked today, today, I never got any success on the right side of the figure. And that was a problem. Uh, so we, we say that, okay, so that's, that seems, that seem, you know, the, the right side of the figure is quiet, right side of the figure is hard. So how about this? How about we start from the success of supervised learning and then just trying to do something quite lazy. So here's a, what, a lazy thing that you could do. So first of all, you train like an image model on the training set. That's supervised learning. Everybody knows how to do it. And then you collect like an unlabeled data set. And then you basically use your train model to infer the labels. So this is fake labels on the unlabeled set. Okay, so you 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 gotta you you collect you, you go to the internet, you download like 100 million images, you take your pre-trained model, and then you infer fake labels on that data set. That's easy. Everybody can do that too. Now the third step is is uh, is people don't know is that basically you take the new fake labels data set, combine with the old label data set, and pretend that the new data set is accurate labels, and then train a new student model on that. That's the probably the laziest anyone could do, right? So this is not new. This is what people in the past call self training. So these people have done this for like fifty years. So this is not new. Now, what we really su surprised is that this thing works and nobody actually tried it really seriously. So this, thing, this basic thing out of the box already works. So if you train this thing, if you do, you have a supervised model at any level of accuracy, you do cell training and then you get like a margin, a small margin of gains across the board because that's your su supervised learning model already works. So that's, that's good. Now, one thing that it doesn't work very well is that it gives a bump, but it doesn't give a big enough bump so that pe people don't like it. So I say, so what's the problem? So the problem is that when in step two, if you infer labels, the, the model that you train in step one can make mistakes. And the model in step one makes a mistake and the mistake gonna be in, eaten up in step number three. So you get some fake labels, some fake labels are incorrect. And then basically the, 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 teach, the student model gonna suffer from the mistakes, right? So it's basically confirmation bias. So you, the, the, the student model can get worse and worse because of the mistakes, right? So you say, okay, so what's the solution for this? So the solution is to add some noise to the student model so that it becomes more robust. Um, and the one note here is that when the teacher in step two, when you infer the labels, don't inject any noise. Make sure that the labels is as accurate as possible. But in step three, when you train the student model, inject some noise to make sure that the student model can actually be more robust than the teacher model. And this thing really works, right? That's the, that's the easiest thing that one can do. So basically the noise is actually also quite uh, easy to find. You know, people already develop data augmentation noise, a uh, dropout, stochastic depth, all kind of noise that people develop in the last decade. So the 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 picture for this is this. So you you have a cat picture, and the the teacher gonna generate you like a, a prediction, and this is like a soft label, right? This is the largest, and somewhere it's gonna put zero point eight because this is the cat. You know, it say that this is mostly eighty percent probably with 80% probability that this image is a cat, right? So, you know, in step, this is step two, that step two will do this. In step three, what you do is that when you train the student model, don't train it on this image, train it on like a distorted image. 
but trying to predict this label, this, 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 this label being generated here. So if there's some noise in the label, then the noise in the input can actually counter it for you a little bit. So then the model we pre prefer to learn from the, the clean pair of examples. That's what we, we found. And basically doing that, so then we're gonna get big gain across the board, right? Uh, starting from, this is, you know, efficient net models. We do efficient, you know, efficient net model plus this uh, cell training plus noise. And everybody model we train, we get better accuracy. Small model, big model, everywhere. You can get a big boost in accuracy, you know. Here, uh, the typical gain you might see is about 1% improvement or something like that. Uh, but you can run this training many, many generations. So you can get a better student and then you take the student to generate pseudo labels again and then train. And then you, you get better and better. Now the, the gain get uh, diminished a little bit over the time, but that's what we, uh, you know, you, you will get from, uh, from somewhere between 1% to 1.5% on image net, which is usually very difficult. Uh, okay, so so um, uh, one thing that we also do is evaluate the model that we train on, uh, you know, robust uh, robustness data sets, and um, we uh, we uh, you know we evaluate on ImageNet A and C and P. These data sets are developed at Berkeley uh, by uh, uh, Hendrix and uh, colleagues, and we also found pretty sub substantial gains. Uh, so basically, um, on ImageNet A. Uh, the state of the art was 61% and we got, went to, you know, 84% or something like that, you know, big, big gain um, uh, in, you know, in image net C, some big gains and image net B also some big gains. So, so this, this method tend to be not only improve the accuracy, but also improve the robustness that was a, a lot. Um, so that's uh, what happened, you know, around one and a half years ago. And then building on that success, uh, we, we want to push further. So the model that we trained got to 88.4% accuracy. But we say that, how about, how about improving to get to like 90% accuracy? Uh, so this is the, the method that I described to you. You, you, know, you have a pre-trained teacher, you generate zero label data, you inject some noise, you train the student model, and that's gonna get you better accuracy. Now, recently we found that like, there's still some confirmation bias going on in here. So uh, we want to insert a, like a little feedback loop back to the teacher model. So the student, the student performance on the label data gonna get feedback into the, uh, the teacher and the teacher also co-train with the student. So but in, in this meta zero label, the teacher and the student co-train together. So we train one iteration of the teacher and one iteration of the student. And the, this second arrow down here is through reinforcement learning. So we train one iteration of the teacher, one iteration of student, et cetera. So one update the teacher, one the update the student. So this idea is called meta pseudo labels. And basically it actually improves um, uh, a lot. For example, from the, for the two moon data set, this is a toy data set, you can get like a meta pseudo labels can actually fix some of the problems occur uh, in uh, pseudo labels um, uh, that, you know, it was not possible to fix before. Uh, so on ImageNet, basically, the first idea that I told you, inject some noise using cell training, get bump you from 84 point, uh, 86.4% to 88.4%. And then this meta pseudo label bump from 88.4% to like 90.2%. So that's, that's the latest. And basically the, uh, Okay, to get to, just to explain to you how hard it is to get this ninety percent. Okay, so this this thing requires about five hundred and twelve TPUs uh, V four uh, on uh, two days with three hundred million images, uh, unlabeled Im ex additional uh, unlabeled uh, images, right? So that's a, a it's not a lot of work, but it re it it does require some resources to get to that level uh, of accuracy. Um, 
uh, just to show you how how you know to calibrate with the rest. So, so there's a lot of noise around self-supervised learning, um, and you know a lot of you know, this paper from my uh, from Facebook, uh, you know, talking about SEER getting top one accuracy of eighty four point two percent accuracy. You just like calibrate with what we accomplished using the cell training. We already got to eighty eight point four and ninety percent. So different methods though. But just to show you that the cell training methods are extremely effective compared to the pre-training method that people use um, in the literature. Uh, okay, just to conclude uh, my part of the talk, right? Before I told you about, you know, uh, su supervised learning uh, method tend to overcome semi-supervised learning method uh, as soon as you have enough label data. Now, what we developed develop in the research in the past few years is to shift this curve a little bit to the left, uh, the semi-supervised learning curve to the left. Uh, so much that the semi-supervised learning curve, I, I'm now very comfortably uh, comfortable to tell you that semi-supervised learning is already here to stay and is actually overcoming you know, su su supervised learning, not only in the low data regime, but also in the high data regime. Uh, so yeah, with that, you know, I, end, I can end my talk and then take questions. My kind of general question, because there's a lot of students that are actually tuned in. I wonder if there's particular, like what your advice to them would be in terms of a, like a class or a skill or something that you wish you had someone had told you like, do this when you're in school, this will be, if you want to kind of be successful, this is something that I wish I had access oh. to. <laughs> oh, I see. Um, well, uh, I, tr I, I try to uh, develop a good intuition about, you know, uh, this is some, this is a comment that I can comment particularly about deep learning, but not general, is that uh, if you want to do deep learning successfully, deep learning is becoming somewhat uh, empirical. So uh, my advice for someone is to just to basically play around with the experiments a lot, right? Try to develop a good intuition. And before you do an experiment, maybe you can say, okay, what is the intuition here? And if, if you, the, the experiments, uh, empirical data doesn't match up, you know, uh, try to, to explain why, right? And then use that as a way to learn. Uh, and then maybe take a, take a good class in, in deep learning at Berkeley, right? I, I don't know, I don't, I'm not too familiar, but I think deep learning is gonna be here. So it's, it's already, I think it's gonna do, uh, gonna continue to make really great impact, especially in the industry. So, you know, do that. Um, uh, so, Rock, well. yeah. I, I have a related question, and that yeah. is, you mentioned how you're following intuition, yeah. and uh, I'm a big believer in intuition, but yeah. some people will complain that uh, when is this finally going to become rigorous, well, that we, well, we know how well we're doing, we'll have proofs, and so on and so forth. What's going to happen? See. Uh, okay, so that that's something that I don't, you know, I'm 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 a practical guy, so I um, uh, I I see a lot of the time that um, uh, I don't believe. Uh, so there was a so you know that like, there's this thing called batch norm that you know people use a lot. Before batch norm, it turns out that I I um, some colleague of mine and I was working on something that was quite related, but I wasn't so happy about the lack of. Uh, uh, you know, uh, theoretical rigor for that. So we ended up not publishing it and not ended up not talking about it because it's lack of theoretical rigor. Uh, so I think I see, I see the, I'm on the wrong side of that question in the sense that I, I would say from now on, I would be encouraged to people to talk about things that without even strong theoretical rigor, but there's some strong empirical evidence that it, uh, that it works. Um, and then, no, you know, I, like I look all, I, I, yeah, I agree yeah. with your philosophy, and uh, that's the, just where the field happens to be. Now, yeah. uh, I have a, a quick question. Uh, many of the uh, uh, accuracies were saturating in the high 80s. I was yeah. under the impression that we could get into the 90s. Wh why are things saturating, um, in your examples, only in the high 80s? I think like, uh, okay, so I, uh, I don't know, but I think the, the last few objects are extremely difficult in the sense that if you don't see them, if you don't see enough images, you won't be able to get, uh, to get any good improvement there. 
Um, so I, I, I met this uh, person who is an, uh, when I started working on this image net again in 2017, I met Christian Zagadi, who is like a world expert in this area. And I said, I'd ask him, you know, what, what is the, what is the, what is the headroom head on image net, right? And he said, okay, um, uh, headroom of image net, uh, you know, like image net will start to write around 82%, but right? you can't get beyond 82%. That is, that, that, that is like, you can't get beyond 82% anymore. Uh, and I asked him why, and he said, you know, like he, he visualized some of these images and they, they're just very hard, even, very hard for even a human. But it turns out that it's, 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 not, it's not true. You, you need to just see a lot of unlabeled images to get Yeah, there. so um, uh, I don't want to hog all the questions, but let me try one more question, if I may. I intuitively, I understood the noisy student because yeah. you have confirmation bias and anything that breaks it up is helpful. I didn't quite understand the meta pseudo labels. Can you I see. just quickly? Oh. Yep, okay. So I, I, can, I can explain to you through this picture. Okay, so you have these four, uh, three, you have two clouds and the, the correct decision function should be uh, like this, right? Like a, like a moon, like a, like, this is the decision function that go across like this, right? And then uh, you uh, you have some label points, which are the blue point. So the uh, and then the de correct decision function like this. But because you, if you have too few uh, points, the decision function can be wrong. And in this case, let's give you an example that the decision function look like the pink and then the green. Okay, uh, there are two two classes. Now, if you use that, then if you use pseudo label, then the you you end up with a wrong decision function that even misclassify your original examples, right? So this example right here that I'm pointing my pointing my arrow to, it's been misclassified. Okay, so meta pseudo label is basically to tell you again that this this exa these examples have been misclassified, so correct it. So, so the the teacher now is informed that okay, it made it is making a new decision function to teach a student. The student learns from it, but is now making the mistake on the original example. So maybe like readjust a little bit the decision function, so that that the teacher and the student now is actually updating each other. Um, okay, the real world example and a real world uh, intuition for this is coaching, is that. You know, like sometimes someone is really smart, like Bill Gates, but he also needs a coach. The coach can see things that he he can't not see. So he's trying, like the coach is trying to see at, from the high level picture, like all the label example, how he's wrong. So that's the intuition. But of course, like there must be like a mathematical foundation for this that I love, we love to explore later. Um, we also had a question from uh, Avide. Okay. Did you want to uh, unmute yourself? I, th I think I'm unmuted, right? Oh, great. We hear you. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, I guess this is more like a philosophical comment rather than a question. Uh, it seems to me that, I mean, you talk about having 10,000 CPUs running them for two weeks. Uh, yeah. It seems to me this is something unattainable for us at the university. Um, yeah. do, do you have any like suggestions of the kinds of problems that at the universities we can make uh, progress on without having access to, to, trust, to such incredibly large amount of computing resources. I see. Oh, I, 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 before I was also nervous, even myself, right? Because, you know, like compute is always relative. I'm, I'm high compute compared to yours, but I'm less compute than others, let's say. So I think one thing that really a, a blessing recently that I've learned is that the scaling law is that um, so what I, so I, I want to go back into this figure at this figure at the very beginning of my talk. So this figure right here. Uh, so what you want to find is that uh, if you ever develop uh, any model or, or if you plot accuracy uh, against like latency or something like that, you end up with something called a Stirling law. It's basically as you make the model bigger, you, you're going to get better. So that's predictable. What is predictable is it's gonna, some models gonna, uh, you know, if you make the, your model twice as big, you might end up getting better uh, accuracy. So that's predictable. 
So what you contribute is that if you are around on, on here, or if you have resources around here on the left side of the figure, you might want to just try to develop models in such a way that you know the scaling law is in favor to you. So in, in all other words, you try to bend it uh, better than the original curve. So first of all, absolute, you have to be doing absolute better than this on the, on the left side of the figure, or that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is trying to develop uh, a model in such a way that the scaling law for your model is better. That's my interpretation of all of this. And you're saying this is not known. It's something that we have to kind of do research and figure out how to do that. Is that what you're saying? Uh, I think the scaling laws are becoming more established. Right. How, what, what is the initial model that is, is, has that? that has a better property or uh, what kind of scaling or some, sometimes you get a worse model, let's say. Let's suppose that you work on in, in an academic paper and you get a worse model. Well, who knows that it has a better scaling property than all the models, right? Maybe maybe the, the, the slope of the, your model is actually better, even though the absolute is worse. So yeah, but without having access to incredible amount of compute resources, how could we... Yes, so what I'm saying that? is, Try to get a few dots on the very left side of your figure. Oh, I see. I see. I got it. I got it. To extrapolate from those. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Avide. Um, so we have another question from uh, Jiha. Do you want to ask your question? Yes, thanks. So first question is, so the neural architecture search really opened um, a few. So there are a lot of paper. So if only one paper, so what, what do you suggest? Like uh, only one NAS, which one you suggest to use? Oh, I, I recommend reading the DATS paper. It's not written by me, but the, the DATS paper mm -hmm. by CMU. That, that's a good paper by my colleague. Uh, yeah. uh, it, it's a good paper. It's a, it's a form of efficient uh, architecture search done by mm -hmm. BAPRO. So I, I like that paper. Thanks. Then yeah. another question is, so I listen to open AI people's talks. So they always say bigger models means big, uh, high performance. And yep. the thing here, you're doing the inverse, like a small but efficient. So what yep. do you think is the future of the- uh, Okay, so we don't contradict by the way. So I, like, we, we agree. So we agree because I show you this figure, right? I tell you that it's true that this is like, if you make a model bigger, you, you, you're you going to better, get a better accuracy. Mm -hmm. However, the problem is that I told you that the, the curse of these scaling laws is that at some point, you're going to have to use all the compute at Google to do it. It's, it's too large. So one thing that I do with neural architecture search is either to develop a better model on the left side of the figure, mm -hmm. or figure out a way to scale it up in such a way that it has a better scale, it had a better slope. You understand what I'm saying? So if you think about this figure right here, this figure right here, what I'm trying really hard is to get a better slope. If you, this is not in lock, you see what I'm saying? It's not yeah. in lock, but if you put it in lock, it's just a better, a better slope, right? That's a, 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 better, a better line. That's basically what it's saying. So we don't contradict. We're doing the same thing. Yes. So, uh, a final question is for the for the student teacher models. So in my understanding, uh, is the best student network just copy the teacher's parameters? How can like a student surpass a teacher's performance? So what's, yes. can you tell me the intuition behind this? Yes, so okay. it's, still, it's, still, it's still a mystery, I think. So even with this, without any knowledge, by the way, even the, with this, right? So I'm just saying, telling you that we do train on one data set, then infer the label and train the student on the combined set, you get a better uh, model. Mm -hmm. Even with this, without any noise, you already get a little bit of gain. And that is a, still a mystery for us. We still don't know. I see. We still don't know, even with this. Now, however, I can confirm with you that if you add noise to the student when you train, mm -hmm. then you get better accuracy. And we're going to explain that. And the, the reason is that because the student become more and more robust than the teacher. So that's what we can explain. But like why cell training out of the box already works that we don't know. Still a mystery. Uh, 
All right, I think we have time for maybe one more question. And we had one from uh, Ani, do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, so, um, hi, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my question is, it seems like we're kind of nearing the end of the line for ImageNet for the kind of supervised, um, like the, the supervised and self-supervised regimes. What do you yeah. think is like the next frontier for um, uh, self-supervised in, in like maybe the next couple of years, next two or three years? Uh, do you think it's going to be like object detection, semantic segmentation, uh, or do you think that there's like the next big problem is going to be like harder data sets in image recognition? Uh, maybe like, you know, like automotive yeah. or things like that. Yeah. Oh, great question. I would say that, you know, um, I'm not too sure if it's true that like it's the end of the line, right? So if you zoom into this figure, and let's suppose that you uh, uh, you on the left side of the figure, you just finish this ResNet plus Instagram project, you might say that it's also end of the line. Mm -hmm. But you know, people still can get ninety percent. And uh, let me try to articulate why this ninety percent is significant, right? Because if you build a self-driving car, you really want to get the last few percent because that's few percent gonna get you know gonna you know, kill people, right? So yes. it's still significant that we, we have to push this. So that's the first thing that I want to say. Uh, so I don't think, I don't I don't know if it's the end of the line. I still think that there's some headroom here. This is also, this is only 90% top one. So so I think it's still room. Uh, second thing, second thing is that I think it is true that getting better is harder, but I've, I've seen a lot of good ideas about creating data sets like ImageNet A, C, and B. Uh, the work by Annie or Hendrix at uh, Berkeley. Uh, I think the future would be, you know, taking this data set and making them, make, making the test set. I, the first step is making the test set a lot harder, right? Like if you look at some of these images, they are not really like, if a human look at them, recognizable. For example, this image right here is submarine, right? But the model is just predicting Cano, for example, which is not good. And you, you also see a lot of in, uh, a lot of sensitivity of the model. For example, if you translate the uh, the the fridge a little bit uh, or the car a little bit here, rotate the car a little bit, the prediction went wrong. So even the next step, just try to make the models more robust is already pretty important because you know you can connect that to self-driving cars right away. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you don't want the, the prediction on the self-driving car to basically change from one the frame to another frame, right? So I, I still see a lot of that, uh, you know, at the very, uh, I, I think that's still, the, that is the next frontier of the field. Uh, now, uh, detection and segmentation, I, I just feel that they are, they're going to inherit all the good, good stuff from, from application. Yeah, that's what I predict. Awesome. Thank you so much. Great. So thank you for, I think from all the, the audience, very inspiring work. And I want to definitely from Eli and I thank you, Kwok, for just really showcasing an amazing body of work and also really putting it into context and challenging us for what, should, what we should be working on next. So I know a lot of people are really excited to have you join us. Uh, I wish we could take you out to dinner and do lots of other great things. We'll have to do that sometime later, right, Eli? Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, we'll have another opportunity soon, we hope. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And, and thank you again for a really great yeah. talk. Really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. It's an honor. Thank you.